talking about officer and trustee liability. And I'm going to look at two areas. One is what are the basics of financial and um, governance obligations and liabilities of officers and trustees of not-for-profits. Um, and then a quick look at health and safety as well. So um, just uh, starting first of all with financial liability and duties. Um, first point I wanted to make is that actually the structure of your entity does have a bit to do with what your personal liability is. Um, and so um, in the, in the not-for-profit area, we do deal with some, some not-for-profits that are in the form of a company, but very often it would be a trust or an incorporated society. Uh, and with an incorporated society, or, or with, with a trust or a society, it can be incorporated or unincorporated. Um, and so that probably is the first point of significance in terms of understanding your own liability, because if it's unincorporated, uh, then it doesn't exist in the sense of being a legal entity. So an unincorporated trust or an unincorporated society may have tax status, it may have an IRD number, uh, file tax returns, but it doesn't have any separate legal status. And all that exists is the group of people that make up that society or the trustees that make up that trust. And so if something goes wrong, in terms of legal accountability, there is no other entity, it's only you. Um, now you might think that's not something to worry about, but we have worked over the years with any number of uh, trusts in particular where a trust has been formed, uh, but never formally incorporated under the Charitable Trust Act for whatever reason. Um, and so those trustees have been operating over the years with personal liability for everything that they're doing, probably without realising that that was the case. Um, so that's unincorporated. Um, so, but even if you are an incorporated society or a trust, it is important to be aware that as a trustee or an officer, you do still have some liabilities personally for the activities of that entity. So, generally speaking, trustees, the board and the members of a society aren't personally liable for the contractual obligations of the entity that they're acting on behalf of. Uh, because it is, once it's incorporated, it is a separate legal person at law. Um, so you, you're generally not personally liable in terms of contractual liability and a lot of negligence claims, those sorts of things you won't be liable for. Uh, but there still are some quite significant duties, uh, really very similar to what, in a lot of ways, to what the directors of a company would owe to the company and to the creditors of the company. Uh, so with an incorporated society, for example, the board has a duty to act in good faith in the society's best interest and for a proper purpose, a duty to act in accordance with the society's rules and objects. Um, so both of those are in terms of understanding what your constitution says and then making sure that what your, what your entity is doing actually fits within the, the, um, the constitution. So it's been set up for a purpose, but maybe over time your activities have crept. Are you still acting for the same purposes that you were originally created for? Uh, and if you're not, then that's potentially a problem. Um, this third bullet point, ensure the society's affairs are carried out in a way that does not create a substantial risk of loss to society's creditors. <coughs> so again, that sounds very similar to um, duties in terms of reckless trading and self trading, that sort of thing in the context of a company. Um, ensure the society does not incur obligations that cannot fulfil, take reasonable care, and then not personally profit from your position in relation to that entity. So all of these are very similar to what you would see in a company. Now with an incorporated trust, uh, trustees still have potential liabilities as well. Personally liable for breach of trust. So again, you have a trustee, you have powers and you have restrictions on what you're allowed to do. And if you act outside the purposes of your trust, um, you're potentially personally liable for whatever follows from that. And again, this is maybe a little bit of a scary one, I don't know, but if, um, if, you're, if the trust that you're a trustee of fails to pay its, its, um, its ACC levies or its GST or its PAYE, as a trustee you can be personally liable for that in some circumstances as well. Um, so, uh, and then finally, for, uh, for fiduciary duties to act with loyalty, honesty and in the best interest of the trust charitable purposes, the duty of care, skill and diligence. Again, very similar to what we saw with incorporated societies and a lot of analogy to what you would have with a company. So how do you minimise the kinds of risks that you face personally as a trustee or an officer of a not-for-profit? Well, first, the first point is actually understanding what do we exist for and are we doing what we exist for? So what are your charitable objects? 
what are your purposes? And with that, what, what powers do exist in this entity? What am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? If, if, if our entity is asked to give a guarantee for somebody else, are we allowed to do that under our trust deed? Uh, do we have the power to do that? Understanding the limits on what you're allowed to do is, is crucially important. Um, by default, under the um, trust, Trustee Act, uh, the trustees of a trust, including a charitable trust, have various investment duties, including the need to be prudent and diligent in carrying out your duties and in carrying out your in investment activities. Now, you can modify that to a degree in the wording of your trustee, but if that hasn't been done, um, then you have that liability as well. So what decisions are you making about what the entity is doing with its assets? Are you acting in a way that is what a prudent investor would do in relation to those assets? Uh, do you know what your obligation is in that area? Um, and understand what policies and procedures are in place for your, your entity, and are you regularly self-auditing, making sure that the policies are actually being followed in your, in your entity so that if there's a problem, um, you know, it's going to be dealt with in a way that's been thought out in advance. Um, and then this one here, understand the process for appointing trustees and retirement of trustees, which I think, again, is one of the points that you made, Philip, as well. And it's a, it's a really good one. Uh, Stephen and I were working with a trust last year where um, it was established in the 1980s, um, and they had been merely appointing trustees for years, Without any, without any reference to what was actually... Uh, well, actually, interestingly enough, when you looked at the trust deed, they had copied their trustee appointment clause from another trust deed. It was back in the days of a typewriter, and somebody had been typing it in, and then, you know, had scanned to the end of the line and then missed a couple of lines and then carried it on with the same word down below. So their trustee appointment clause actually didn't make sense at all. <laughs> uh, and yet they had been appointing and replacing trustees for 30 years. And then somebody had actually read the trustee and said, well, hang on a minute, what are we supposed to be doing here? And so they, they came to us because they didn't know how, how they could rectify that situation because all the trustees had been appointed under this faulty process um, and they wanted to um, give themselves some kind of valid constitutional status so that they could actually fix the trustee and, and, and get some words in there that actually made sense. Uh, so yeah, so 30 years that trust had been at, yep. operating like that and that's by no means an unusual story. Um, I'm going to quickly um, talk about, well, I'll just run through this one quickly. Good questions to ask. Um, in terms of your own personal liability, does the trustee have any limitation clauses for my protection and the wording of the deed itself or in the constitution? Um, and secondly, given the risks that I'm taking on as a trustee, what sort of insurances does the entity have in place for its officers to protect me if something does go wrong? Um, those, those are just two examples of really good questions you should be asking, but the basic point is, don't assume just because I'm a volunteer that I'm not liable, because that's very likely to be wrong. Uh,